Hello and welcome, everybody. Um, today is February 16th, so uh, this is our 30th uh, Platform Academy session. I am very proud to welcome all of you um, to this session. I am glad that so many are joining us. And with that, I will get into today's session. We are joined by Alex Coop today. And we will be talking about localization, uh, internationalization, and all of the longization words. <laughs> so I'm uh, very, very impressed that you are daunting to uh, pronounce all of the words uh, repeatedly. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we will get into introductions in just a second. Um, I will just get this uh, wonderful safe harbor out of the way. Uh, you probably all know this already. If we are uh, going to address any forward-looking um, statements or, or uh, product features, uh, don't make any purchasing decisions based on anything you hear today. As I said, I am very glad you joined us. This is a live on ServiceNow webinar. We have a whole series of academies uh, by now. I would love for you to check them out. We have, um, I have more links later in this presentation. We have our sister teams talk about next experience, about um, performance analytics or platform analytics, virtual agent, mobile, all kinds of platform topics. Um, so I want to encourage you to join those if you're interested in those topics. And then um, as a final thing from my side, uh, some housekeeping items. We uh, do save time for Q&A at the, at the end. But uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button at any point, uh, the, the Q&A panel. Send us your questions. We want this to be a little more interactive. We love your feedback. We want to hear from you how you're using these products. Um, what are your difficulties? What are your challenges? How would you like us to address these and how we can help you? And what do you think about this presentation um, and this, this content today? This presentation will be uh, recorded as always, and we will share this um, sometime later next week. I will edit the session, upload to YouTube, and post on the ServiceNow community. We'll also share the deck as a PDF uh, so that you have access to the resources. And then after the event, you will be prompted to pull out a short survey. I have another short survey link in this uh, presentation. I would love for your feedback, so please give us your feedback. Um, as ways of introduction, my name is Lisa Hohenstein. I'm an outbound product manager for the Now platform, focusing mostly on workflow automation topics. I've been with ServiceNow just over four years now. I've been working with the ServiceNow platform for almost seven. So, um, so much about me. I am very happy to introduce Alex to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Coop, and I'm the Director of Globalization Deployment here at ServiceNow. Uh, I've been in the company for just over three years, and my first foray into ServiceNow was way back in ooh, beginnings of 2012. So I was a pre-Aspen person. My first upgrade project was winter 2011 to a domain-separated Aspen instance, oh, believe it or not. That so sounds like an adventure. <laughs> it was a baptism of fire, I'll say that. <laughs> But over that time, um, I kind of developed this notion I wanted to do multinational projects. I wanted to get into the big stuff um, because why not? It's fun. It's complicated. It's good to learn the good things. And uh, now in service now, I head up our customer and partner enablement aspect to do with multilingual implementations or uh, non-English implementations. And I sit in what we call our internationalization team. And therefore, we own the UI capability to represent non-English. So if it needs to show French, if it needs to show German, if it needs to show Japanese, that sits with us across all of the UIs. And on top of that, we also own the 22 language packs. So the 22 UI translation packs, basically. So that kind of gets me into the nice next slide, because we need to get through some terms, the isations. So... We're going to go through what they are, and I'm going to give you a nice little nugget of how to uh, remember them, right? So if we go to the next one, and everything we're going to go through here is actually in our training materials. We've got a whole course on now learning. We've got a bunch of blogs and whatnot, and I can see some famous names in the attendees list. I'm not going to name any names, but there is one that piqued my interest. So if you know who you are. <laughs> okay, so if we go to the next bit. The first term that we need to learn is internationalization. And the idea here is to say, I've built an app, I've built a piece of software, I've built anything, 
and it can work with other languages, meaning that the text that we want it to show is understood in the system to be externalized and therefore translatable, but it has no specific nuances or needs for a country or for a language, meaning this app will work. So that's not a ServiceNow concept, that is a software industry concept. It would apply to an iOS app, it would apply to a computer game, all those different things. The trick here to remember this is the I18N, that's an industry standard. And the 18 is actually the number of letters that are come after the first letter, which is I, up to the O, which is before the N, and you'll count it, that's 18 letters. So if you Google I18N, you'll get this. So we'll go to the next one. So the next term we need to learn is localization. And that's the idea of having the translations done as well as adding visual specificity, that's a big word, um, for what that translation is. And that could be anything from a date format, a time format, a currency, all those little aspects that make it specific to that given region or locale, as we say in the industry. The short term code for this is L10N. And again, the 10 is the number of letters between the L and the N. So if we go to the next one. Then we have translation. Pretty obvious what this is. It's the act of translating a source text from a source language into a target language. So that could be English to French, or it could be English to Japanese, or it could be English to German or English to Spanish. Doesn't really matter. But there are two aspects here. It could be human translation, as in someone is actually writing it themselves or it could be machine translation where you're using technology and of course there's hybrids in there there's different types but we'll get to that later and if we get to the last one and that's the idea of globalization which is a bit of an umbrella term and i don't mean in the supply chain world i mean in this world it is literally bringing all of these different aspects together so it's like the strategic part oh, the strategic part if you will and that short term is g11n 11 being the number of letters between the g and the n so we go to the next one. Yellow pattern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, when we think about translation, we have to bear in mind that it's not as simple as just adding the translations on top. So we've got a bit of theory that we need to get through first. And the theory is to say that languages are not equal. OK, and we're going to go through different examples and different scenarios. But think of it like this. Let's take British English, because I'm just outside London, that's why it's a bit dark for me. If you're in a, another part of the world and it's bright and sunny, that's why it's dark for me. And if we take American English, we're going to go through certain things. So if we look at the, the next part, we could have scenarios where we have the same meaning from different words. So of course, everybody knows the sidewalk versus pavement and elevator and lift, sure. But if we go to the next part, we can also have scenarios where we have the same word have different meanings. So if any of you have seen my previous webinars on this topic before, I often joke about the idea of a chip. Well, in the UK, that's like a thicker French fry, but in America, that might mean something else, right? There could be a crisp that we would call here, not a chip, right? Like a Dorito or something like that. And obviously you've got a couple, which could mean more than a few, or it could be just specifically two over here. It's not to say it's a hard and fast rule, but it's the concept of saying you might have different meanings from the same word versus you might have a different meaning from different words and vice versa. OK, it can get quite complicated. If we go to the next one, I'm not going to get too much into this because it doesn't really apply to us here. But the notion is also pronunciation, right? The American English would be router, whereas the British English would be router, tomato, tomato, you know, so on and so forth. So the idea here as well is to consider we want to try and connect with the end users wherever they are, okay, whether they're in a specific country or whether they're in a specific area. So if we go to the next bit, we want to try and make sure that the content and the experience resonates with that audience, with that user base, okay? And it's really not as simple as just saying, I want these translations on top. There's a lot of different factors that we're going to think about. So if we go to the next slide, it's going to give us another overview of some other things. We don't need to think too hard about this right now but we just need to be aware of them okay so you could even have spellings so paycheck and paycheck not to be confused with check persons we could have localize <laughs> and localize the i z e versus i s e we could have verbs in different areas of the sentence we could have completely different sentence structures and if we start thinking this with a technical lens for a moment it could actually implicate how we design the interface, right? Think of a UI action. If we use a certain word, it can actually make that button smaller or larger, right? So in Italian, for example, the average word is about three times longer than an English word, whereas in Korean, it could be half the length of an English word. So again, these are all different things we have to think about. And 
If we go further than that and we're wanting to translate content, we have to be mindful of images, specifically photos, right? So if I had a picture of, say, a nice cool looking guy in America with sleeve tattoos down his arm, that would be a bit of a no-no in certain Asian countries because that could imply he's maybe part of a criminal enterprise. Um, or in my case, if you can see here, the name is in red, that could, the person's name specifically, that could mean in Korea that I have died and I really hope I don't because I want to be in this webinar, so. Oh. <laughs> I didn't so, know that one. Yeah, yeah. So it's not to say that this is all there is. There's many, many more. But it's to say that we have to be very mindful of whatever we do for one region, one country, one audience base. It might not necessarily work in that same way for another. Okay. So now we're going to get to the fun bit. If we go to the next one. So the thing here that we want to think about is whenever we're presenting text, in the interface. Let's take something like a scripted message, okay? This is an example of a, a concatenated string, okay? And the first row that you see, you have number items, items in your shopping cart. Technically, yeah, that will work. There's nothing wrong with that from a technical perspective at all. The problem here is when it comes to translate, it's gonna be very difficult because if we've looked and remembered from our previous slide, sentence structures are very different. In some languages, that number wouldn't be there in the sentence. So when the translation tool or person sees that, they're gonna see you have, and then they're gonna see another string that says items in your shopping cart, which is gonna be very difficult to ensure that same meaning. So what we're suggesting here, and this is just technical best practice, regardless of us being ServiceNow, it could be any software development that you want to do, try and keep the sentence as simple as possible. And the sliding scale downwards, as you can see in that image, is getting simpler and simpler and simpler. So in the second example, you'll see a brace zero. That's a parameter in the get message API. And you can see the object being sent is num items. So we can say, okay, in the translation, I can put that parameter wherever I need to and put it wherever, wherever I want for that language. It doesn't need to be the same. The key is you have parameter items in your shopping cart, but the actual message value in that record can be wherever you want. And if you want to get really simple, you can just completely simplify the sentence with that bottom one. And then you can have that number as an object completely separate to the sentence structure entirely. So if we go to the next one for a second, we produce 22 language packs out of the box. And a language pack is basically the out of the box UI translations. So if you install French, if you install German, if you install Hungarian, what you're actually doing is you are including translations of that out of the box UI into five tables. We'll go into the five tables in a minute. But the idea here is to say that we include every plugin. So if you install that language pack, you're going to install the translations for all the plugins and about 450 store apps now as well. And this is where the safe harbor bit comes into it. We're actually changing a little bit of how we deliver the translations. So if some of you noticed or remember how long it used to take before Tokyo, it was quite a long time to install a translation pack. That's it because they were, they were really big, right? There were millions of words that we were unpacking. And then for Tokyo, we've managed to get it down to about 20 to 30 minutes per language. And in the future, it's going to be even quicker, but I'm not going to go too much into that now. But the idea here is all we're really doing, if you know how to translate already in the platform, we're populating it in the same way. We follow the same rules, the same principles. We're not cheating. We're not doing anything else. It is data. When it comes to the UI translations, it is just data that sits in the five tables. So we do it exactly the same way as you, just more. Think of it that way. Hey, Alex, we have one mm -hmm. question uh, concerning the language packs. Do the uh, language packs, the translation packs, cost additional? Nope. They are completely free. No. You can install all 22 right now, free of charge. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. That's a good question. Okay, if we go to the next one for me. So we have to think, why do we want to do this, right? It's not a case of just adding translations. There's always a reason, whether it's a business reason, whether it's an end user reason, we have to think why, okay? So if we go to the next one. So this is an example from one of my demo instances, which we'll do a demo later in a minute, and you'll see how I did this. What we have here is the ESC portal completely translated into Japanese, okay? So you've got catalog items, you've got knowledge articles, you've got VA, you've got the topics, the taxonomy. There are clever ways and quicker ways that this can be achieved. And I'm gonna hopefully show you how I did that, okay? 
if some of you have read my blog, you might already know this, but the idea here is to say that as long as we know what we want to achieve, it is absolutely doable. So if we go to the next one. Uh, before we do, uh, one mm -hmm. more question in, sure. uh, in the Q&A. The default is US English in the platform and there's no option for UK English. Is That's that correct. a reason? That is correct. So we don't provide UK English or British English. UK is actually Ukrainian. Um, but yeah, we don't provide British English uh, out of the box. But if you wanted to, you absolutely could. So if you're on Tokyo or above, you could create a new language record, call it EN-GB, and then you could create a locale and add English specific translations that way. Yeah, that's absolutely Thank doable. You. It's a good question. And that obviously applies to French, French Canadian, uh, different variants of Spanish, different variants of German. So Lisa and I have spoken about variants of German in the past. So <laughs> Austrian German, Swiss German, you know, all that. So if we go to the, the next one, we need to think about what it is that we want to translate, right? Because very often some people can get into the idea of saying, oh, I just need to translate some knowledge articles. Sure. I totally get that, I totally hear that. But at the same time, how are the end users gonna find it if the interface isn't translated? If, they, if we assume that they don't or can't read English as well as we can, they may struggle to interact with the interface to then find where that translation is for that knowledge article, okay? So it's always best to think, okay, what are the user journeys that we need to cover and how are we gonna do that? So in this example, I'm highlighting, we need to translate the UI, whether it's the topics at the top, the menus, the widgets, the virtual agent, and it doesn't have to all be done at once. I wanna be super clear about that. It could be done in stages, but the objective would always be to try and reduce a mixed language experience because that's not gonna help the end user. So try and do as much as you can and then keep it as an iterative process because translations are never one and done. There's always more. You're always creating new catalog items, you're always creating new content, and all of that will need to be translated at some point if that's what your strategy is. Whether it's one extra language, whether it's 20 extra languages, that comes down to your scope and that's absolutely fine. So we go to the next one. So this isn't to say this is explicitly how you should do it. This is just an example of a process. And it's basically to say that you want to get into a cadence where whatever you're building, you have a holistic team, a global, um, a global platform ownership team, if you will. And because they know that they have their coding standards that they need to follow, you can create a repeatable process, right? If everything anywhere on the platform is being built in the same way, and your coding standards are effectively being policed in a holistic way, you can therefore triage any requirements and say, okay, have we built this kind of functionality over here in the platform? And do we now need to use it over here in the platform? Then in theory, that should mean there's less technical debt because we can reuse what there already is, which may, might mean that we could potentially reuse a business rule or a flow or an Another type of integration of some kind and then you can prioritize what they are because if more than one BU is going to use that functionality then that makes a lot of sense right you don't need to reuse well rebuild you can just repurpose and then obviously your maintenance and your solution in building will be a lot lot simpler so if you're dealing at scale when you're trying to build out into say 20 languages for IT HR and other different parts of the business this will make a massive difference in the long run and then obviously because all of those different areas of the business may need to have their content translated. So for example, look at the ESC portal, it brings IT and HR to the business for those end users, then your translation processes and your testing processes can be the same, right? Because it doesn't matter if the content is an IT knowledge article for the end user, like I need to order a laptop. It doesn't matter if it's a HR policy as in how much time do I have off, it will still need to be translated. So you can create that repeatable process. And obviously when it comes to the testing, you need to test your um, UI with native speakers to make sure that you have the right word. So for example, in some languages, there aren't equivalent words as there are in English. So in Polish, some of you may have already heard this in one of my other webinars, if not, it's fine. In Polish, there's no HR word for case in that context. The closest you'll get will be suitcase. So <laughs> if you go, <laughs> yeah, so, if you can imagine that on day one on go live if the end users haven't validated it in context then they'll say i want to raise a suitcase that won't be a very good experience <laughs> for them so we had a similar uh, occurrence a couple of years back when i was a platform owner for an english and german instance and the button on i think change management said screen for the screening stage yeah but in german it thought it was the screen like the display that is in front of you so build show 
it tried to translate this the the stage with the physical device technical device that was interesting yeah before and we go on i have two more questions in the panel sure. um yeah. let's see how they work so uh, the first one it asks, it does ServiceNow provide all the translations or do we have to translate things manually? For example, HR services, does it also translate it? As far as I know, all our products are included in those languages, Correct. right? Correct. If it's an out-of-the-box thing, it will be yeah. translated. If you've built it, you would have to add the translations and we'll go through how in a minute. Awesome. Uh, will we be touching upon NLU later? And I will postpone the next question. Um, we can cover it very high level. Um, in fact, I can probably say a bit of it now. So if you're building a structured VA conversation, right? So one where you present options to the end user, standard topic, right? You can translate them pretty easily. They just get message calls. So if the end user is going to follow the same conversation exactly as it is in English, in French, in German, in Spanish, then you can just translate that same one, build it once. If you actually need to allow free text responses, the utterances, then you basically need to create that same conversation in NLU per language, right? And if you go into the NLU designer, there's actually the functionality there where you can say, I need to have this in another language. You train it on the utterances in that language because remember, languages are not equal. So there could be 10 utterances in English. There could be 20 utterances in German. There could be five utterances in French. I'm just making it up as an example. Yeah. But the idea is you would train it per language. And we're going to show you some pretty cool stuff with what we call the localization framework in a bit, but you can do it with that functionality. So, so the question that we got is, does it work or I, I, I'm thinking the question is, does it work with Brazilian Portuguese or does it still yes. use European Portuguese? So we actually um, do both. So if you go back to slide 11 real quick. Um, so we do Portuguese proper Portuguese, yeah, and we yeah. do Brazilian Portuguese as well. So these are the language packs. I might as well go through them. So obviously English is the base system language. We do Czech, Dutch, Finnish, both versions of French, German, Hebrew, Hungarian, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Norwegian, Polish, Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese, Russian, both variants of Chinese, Spanish, Swedish, Thai, and Turkish. Now that's not to say you can't add more. You absolutely can. I spoke to a customer just last week and they've done a hundred languages. But the idea here is to say, this is the translations we provide for the out of the box. 100, so wild to maintain. <laughs> yeah. It's quite an achievement. Okay, so if we go to the next one. If you want to get um, to Nirvana, right? It's, it's always impossible to have Nirvana from day one, but if you want to get to Nirvana and you want to have everything the best it could possibly be, it doesn't really matter if you use a machine translation. It doesn't really matter if you use a human translation team or even a third party to do the translations. That bit's actually the easy bit. The hard bit is actually defining the governance layer. Okay, so the governance layer of how things should be built for consistency on the platform, ensuring that coding standards are followed and ensuring that all the different areas of the, of the platform are being utilized correctly according to whatever the platform ownership determines, right? So some companies and some groups might call that a steer co. Some may just call that a platform ownership or a shared BU or a global team. Doesn't really matter, but the objective is still the same. So you'd have your technical work stream, you'd have your technical developers of any description, whether they're in-house or third party, that bit doesn't matter. So they're your ServiceNow certified people who can build ITSML or your portal architects or whomever, that's okay. What we're saying here is you actually need to do the same thing for the language side of it, right? Because you need to define the style guides and the glossaries. So we don't want that Polish word for case to come out of suitcase, we want it to be ticket, for example, and they would define that in what's called a glossary. And you might have other concepts, like in Latin languages, you might want to have a particular manner in which that uh, verbiage comes across. Does it come across softly? Does it come across pushy pushy? It depends on the scenario. Does it come across, do you want to have, sorry, um, feminine ending words or masculine ending words? Again, it depends on the specific scenario. And that's all of their role and their responsibility is to say, I'm going to police this language. So for example, if you're going to do French, you should really have a, a French language specialist, sometimes called a lead, and they would own that. And then you'd have a German, and then you'd have a Spanish, and then you'd have so on and so forth. Now, you can obviously use third party 
partners for that, that's absolutely fine, but you want to have a nice guide in there. And then that way, if you do use a machine translation tool, then you can govern it against that. So if you're getting translations come back, you can validate, is this what we intended? Is this how we want the quality to be? Okay, and that becomes different layers of maturity of process. So it's a bit like um, how you do knowledge management in that sense, right? You'd review the articles after a period of time. Translations are no different. You would review them in context before you go live. And we've got a whole methodology of that. We've got a CSC page with tons of material, and I can absolutely share that link if any of you are interested. But we didn't have enough time to go through that today, so just wanted to touch on it. Okay. Right. If we go to the next one, please. So we need to start thinking about how we do the technical stuff now. Now we've got the theory and we understand the implications and we understand, you know, give or take what it's what we need to plan for, we need to start thinking how it's going to work. So if we go to the next one. So the actual platform itself, I'm going to talk about it in two different ways. We have the UI translations and that sits in five tables, which we're going to go through in a minute. And then we have content and content in, to me is knowledge articles. Okay, because you're generating new content. So if we go to the next bit, the first table that we need to think about is the SysUI message table. So this is typically for scripted messages. Okay, so think of alerts, think of add info messages, think of confirms, think of portal widget titles. Every time that you need to do uh, an add info message, add error message, et cetera, et cetera, all those different things, you're putting text in script, this is where you should be putting the actual entry, okay? So there's a whole method that we call get message, and there's a concept called hard-coded strings. I'm not gonna go too much into it right now, but again, it goes back to my point earlier of coding standards. We've got a whole blog post on it, we've got a whole bunch of training on it. It would take me too long, unfortunately, to go through hard-coded strings, but the idea here is if your code is externalized correctly, then the data for the translations would sit in this table. So you'd have one entry for English, you'd have one entry for French, you'd have one entry for Spanish, and so on and so forth. Okay, if we go to the next one. The next table we'd think about is a drop-down choice, right? It could be a variable if it's a question choice type, or it could be a field such as the state field. Those entries sit in sys choice. Just where you put the English ones is exactly where you put the translated ones, okay? So they just have a language field on it. You duplicate them, so you've got three for English, you do three for French, and you do three for German, etc. It's exactly the same. Okay, if we go to the next one. Then we have sys documentation, which is for field labels. So exactly where you define the English field label is where you put the translated field labels. And it has a nice little language field on that table as well. So if you've got one label for that field in English, you duplicate it and you put another label and you put the value what that is in the other language and so on and so forth. Okay. That's the one that shows as a related list on the dictionary yes. items, right? That's correct. Cool. And if we go to the next one. We have sys translated, ah. and this is governed by a field type called a translated field. So if you look at the type of field and it says translated field, it will reside in here. So it has a permutation where it needs to know what table it's for, what element, which is the field that it's for, and then you can put the English value and then you can put the translated value. And then obviously you would duplicate those records per language. The nugget here is this does not hold the English entry. So bear that in mind. And then the one that people always struggle with is this translated text. This is governed by a translated text field or translated HTML field. It works for both of them. It works very similar to how this translated works, but it has one extra piece of information, which is the document column, which maps to the sys ID of the originating English. Okay. I've got a whole blog post on how these tables work. It's very, 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 very long, but it's very detailed. And again, I will share that with you guys later. But the takeaway here, if you just show the last block, the takeaway here is to say that from the UI's perspective, so we're not talking about NLU, we're not talking about knowledge content or anything like that, just the UI, the translations just sit in these five tables. So if we know how they work, we can make it do what we want it to do. That's the takeaway. Okay. We have another good question about translations. Um, and I think I know the answer for this one is does trans, uh, does localization support notifications yet? Last I checked years ago, it didn't. Ooh, or perhaps it question. was just not with emails containing sections generated by mail scripts. Are these supported? Uh, as so of Tokyo. As of Tokyo, we can translate notifications, which makes my heart very happy because that is also something that I did when I was a platform owner, we have those mail scripts. 
And we actually called a script include that would look up the, the recipient language yep. and then send the appropriate, uh, translate the appropriate text. Now you can create translated versions okay. of that email and it will be sent to the person's language in their profile or the default if they don't have. Correct. And you can even go one step further. And if you haven't translated that notification into their language, if you have a dynamic translation with a cloud MT provider, then you can actually do it on the fly. Yeah. Which is really cool. It but is pretty cool. It goes back to the quality question. So you'll just have to bear in mind. So we put a prefix along the top of the dynamically generated emails and it will say this email has been translated by whomever. It's always good to set that expectation because if there's yeah. a mistranslation, then that they're gonna be more forgiving as an end user, just like you would if you went on Google Chrome and went to an international website and you saw something that wasn't quite white, you would be okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I okay. also think that's an amazing feature um, and feedback and chat is nice, I agree. I agree, I agree. It's been on my radar for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> At least 2015, 2016 in my case, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's all right, it's good. Okay, so if we go to the next one. So I'm going to start talking about some architectural principles now, and I can certainly see at least one good architect in the chat. So the idea here that we have to think about is if we're going to be building out a solution, whatever it is, we always need to bear in mind what building blocks, and I always refer in the platform to everything is a building block, right? A field is a field, a form is a form, a table is a table, a component is a component, a widget portal is a, port is a widget portal, and so on and so forth, right? As long as we know how they work and as long as we know how they're supposed to be used it doesn't really matter where in the platform they are used we just need to be mindful of how we're connecting them together for the use case that we want right so here is to say whatever the solution is we just need to remember and bear in mind how those different building blocks work this isn't an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination there's many more i couldn't fit all of them on the slide but the idea here is to say if i'm going to be doing a catalog item I know how that works. So I should know and understand what I need to do to translate it and so on and so forth. So let's take a scenario where we've built a process. So if we go to the next one, and in this particular process, we're gonna make it really simple just because it's an analogy. Bob wants something. It doesn't really matter what he wants. Maybe he wants access to something. Maybe he wants to read something. Maybe he just wants help. It doesn't really matter. But that's the beginning of a process. And every process, no matter what it is, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has to, otherwise it doesn't work. So the beginning could be the catalog item or the record producer in the portal, or it could be the beginnings of a topic in VA chat. Sure, that's fine. Or it could even be he's calling up over the phone. Doesn't really matter, that's the beginning. The middle could be a single step that's automated, doesn't matter, or it could be multiple steps of approvals, doesn't really matter. In this scenario, we're saying something happens in the middle and there's an output. And that output leads to either a positive outcome or a negative outcome, okay? So it could have a hundred steps. It doesn't really matter. The process is still a given structured process. If we go to the next one. So we then need to think about if we wanted to have that available for another user. So let's take Yuka in Japan, for example. We don't really necessarily need to build out another version of that process, right? If the steps are the same, the flow will be the same. We might need to feed it different parameters, like maybe it's a different manager for an approval, for example, and we could add logic there. But that doesn't mean we need to create another whole flow, whether it's a workflow or a flow, doesn't really matter, but we don't necessarily need to make another one. But what we do know is that the touch points for Bob and Yuka need to be translated into their respective languages, and potentially some emails might need to be translated into their respective languages. And we might need to think about particular other steps for maybe the fulfillers, you know? So already there's at least three or four different things that we might need to translate. So thinking like that makes things quite a bit easier. So along the way, we might also have to think about a knowledge base. So if we go to the next one, sometimes people think that we need to create tons and tons of knowledge bases, or we might need to do things in a way that is just unmanageable. And that's not strictly true. It always comes down to what your needs are. And I always try and rationalize it into three key questions. And then that will determine how many knowledge bases are best for you. And it's not for anyone else but you guys to think what is best for your needs, right? So I always try and rationalize it as who's the audience? And I'll explain why in a minute. Is that content gonna be globally relevant? 
And does there need to be any locale specific versions of that content? So let's play out a scenario. If I've got a knowledge base that has content that may need to be translated, but it has content that is for everybody, it's basically the same content, whatever that is, it could be 100 articles, could be 10 articles, could be 1000 articles, doesn't matter. And it might need to be in one language or 100 languages, it doesn't matter. If the content is exactly the same and everyone should have access to it, I'd build one knowledge base for that scenario. If I have a scenario where I've got a bunch of content that everybody needs to see, and I've got a bunch of content that may be a particular group of individuals, whether that's in a region or whether that's in a country or whether that's, it could even be an industry specific thing like a union or something like that. That's when I would start challenging the idea of needing another knowledge base and putting their specific content in that other knowledge base. And the reason you could do that, again, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying you could do that, is because then the user criteria at the knowledge base level are going to be automatically sorting out the permissions for any of the articles within it, right? So that's going to have benefits for things like search speed. That's going to have benefits for your publication processes. Because if you only stick with the one knowledge base idea and say everything is in this one knowledge base, it potentially at scale could put a lot of pressure on your publication process because you have to put the right criteria on all of those articles, okay? So you just have to weigh up what's the best pros, what's the best cons. So if we go to the next slide, we'll have a quick look at what one knowledge base will look like. Now, KBs themselves are actually quite simple. Translated articles, they're just related parent-child relationship, okay? So you create your English one, that would be the parent in this example, and maybe I've created a Spanish one as a parent field in the top right-hand corner of the form, and that creates a relationship to that English article, okay? As long as the language field is populated correctly, the system will know it's a translated article. You'll see that in a related list underneath each one. It will say translated articles. And then obviously we could do an Italian one which would be related up to the English one, okay? And sure, you could use content blocks if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, it comes down to pros and cons, right? You need to weigh up what's best for your needs. But this is how one knowledge base would look like. If we go to the next one. And if we look in this scenario, the idea was to say that everybody in the company, if they needed access to content that's relevant to them, they would all have access to the uh, global KB. If you click on the next button, you should see a little animation. Um, there you go. And then in this scenario, we're saying the person in the US can have access to the entire global KB, and they would also have access to a fictitious regional one because maybe there's content that's only needed in this regional one. Now, we're not saying copy any content here. When You wouldn't do that. That would be crazy. <laughs> but the idea here would be if it's regionally specific for North America, they would have access to that. And it could have a lot less content in there compared to the global one. And then conversely, if we had a Canadian user, so if you click again, cool, then the Canadian user in this scenario would have access to all three, right? Because the North American person in the US is not part of Canada, so they wouldn't need access to it. Now, again, pros and cons. It's not to say you should or you have to do this. It's just to say you could if you wanted to. So we don't try and push you into any specific way. It's more to say, the platform is scalable enough that you can do whatever you need to do with it. I think it's probably the best way to put it. Because at the end of the day, the end user, if we go to the next one, they, they don't want to have to navigate your taxonomy. They just want to search and they want that search to present them results. So if we click again, we should see one set of results from one knowledge base. And if we click in, we should see another set of results from another knowledge base, right? Because they, they don't need to know the taxonomy. They don't need to know which subsection it's in or anything like that, right? The process owners do because that's how they manage their process but it's all about the search for the user so the more simple that we make it for them and the quicker and more performant we make it for them the better it will be for them the uh, distribution into different kbs will then also mostly be irrelevant really for the kb writers right the authors the managers the ones that approve so there may be different approval workflows based on yeah. different kbs so if some need more steps to approve the articles then you would have have it in its own KB. yeah yeah exactly that so we've now gone through our language theory we've now gone through some of the considerations we need to think about for the ui let's think about how like what's the really cool stuff that we can do so what capabilities do we have in the platform now this is one of my one pages that i've put together it's quite a busy slide so it's going to take us a minute or two to talk through it but we're going to do some demos as well. Just slight bit. Slight, slight bit. <laughs> so in the Quebec release, we introduced a functionality called the localization framework. And it, I wouldn't be surprised if not many people here 
know what it is because we didn't scream about it, which is fair. But the idea is to say, I've got something, I want to translate it. And if you think of it in that context, it should be a repeatable process because it doesn't matter what that thing is, you're gonna have people who are gonna see the text, whether that's a project manager and say, right, I need to route it to this person or this team or whatever, or if you can use a machine translation agency or a tool or anything like that, you're gonna to want to route it in a particular manner. And that's fine. So since Quebec, we've added more functionalities to it, okay? It's this functionality that lets you do those notifications in other languages. It's all part of this. So this slide is basically saying on the interaction circle, the different areas where you can use either dynamic translation or the localization framework and how. So what we've got to also clarify is exactly what is dynamic translation, right? So dynamic translation, all it really is, it says from the service now side, I need to send some source text to a third party and that third party will do the translation. So imagine Google, imagine Microsoft, imagine Watson, that's all it is, right? That's all it's gonna do. Send, go through the spoke, come back. And we use that for things like agent chat, real-time agent chat. We might use that for knowledge articles as a first pass translation. And we can also use it here for the localization framework. So the same spoke that you would use for agent chat, you could use here as well. Okay, and I'll show you how that looks in a minute. But this is where you can do email notifications, either the templates or the dynamic translations on the fly if you need to. You can do virtual agent, like I said earlier. You can even do service catalogs. You could do a mobile app with um, a custom artifact. You can do a service portal, which I'm going to show in a bit. You can do workspaces, which I'm also hopefully going to show in a bit as well. And you can do KBs. And you can also do surveys, okay? So in Tokyo, we added some more, but think of it like this. It's an engine based on a script include, right? The artifacts, we call these on the side, they're all called artifacts. If we haven't provided one out of the box for you guys, you can write your own. If you know how to write a glide record query, if you know how to um, uh, do yeah, any structured script in the platform, you can write your own, okay? All right, so I think it's time for a demo. Hopefully you can see my screen. That uh, looks good. Cool. So you can turn this on on any of your instances right now. Um, and if you want to use it without an MT, such as Google or Microsoft or whatever, it's free to use manually. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but if you do want to use it with an, a cloud MT provider, you'll need a subscription with them. And unfortunately, MT that's being machine translation, right? Correct. Yeah. And thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> You'd need a subscription with them, which is unfortunately is outside of our control, and you would need Integration Hub. So you may potentially need to have a pro SKU if you don't have that already. So I just have to put that out there. So this is a list on our demo instance of what we call the artifacts. The artifact, as I said, is the proverbial thing that you want to translate. So you can see we've my team's created some proto ones. If you look up my blog on our now forum uh, on our community, you'll see that I've posted a bunch of them. But I'm going to show you one now. Okay, so let's take a catalog item just for speed because it's only going to be a few um, a few seconds to do. So if I was to look up, say, develop a laptop Mac. Okay, I'm on the catalog item table and I want to translate it. Right, you can imagine if this is one. You could do 10, you could do 100, it doesn't really matter. You can do it from the list and select them. But already from that catalog item, I know that I'm gonna to need to translate the name. I know that I'm gonna to have to translate the short description, the description and the variables, and maybe some choices in those variables as well. So potentially I could be looking at three or four of the five translation tables, right? But I don't want to. Maybe I just want this to be simple and I just want this to be doable. See this UI action up here, request translations. I'm gonna click on this. We'll come to the edit one in a minute. So I've added a bunch of languages on my instance just to show that you can, and I've prefixed it with this self-lock to say self-localized, that's what it means. But if I was to take Japanese, right, just because it's easier to see in these demos, what's gonna happen now is the artifact script will run, it will go and find that these fields are translatable field types. And then when it's picked up all of the translation sources, right, which I'll show you in a second, a task is generated and you can automate who that goes to. It's just config, there's no issues there. And you can also define uh, what type of workflow you wanna do. We've pre-canned a bunch in the, um, in the app itself. But if I look at this 
name field, you'll see it's translated text. So straight away, I know that that's going to go to sys translated text. And people are already thinking, oh, but I need that document field value, right? That's the sys ID of this record. But I don't want to do that right now. So let's have a look at this task that's been generated. While this loads, we have another question uh, mm -hmm. about notifications. Are push notifications also supported, like normal notifications? Good question. I'm pretty sure they should be, but we'll double check on that. But I'm pretty sure it should be, yeah. So we've got this task, normal form, nothing special. I can add approvals if I want to. That's fine. I can converse in the work notes. That's also fine. If I hit translate in the top right-hand corner, you'll see that on the right here, it's actually telling me that my translations for these already exist, right? So this is what we call a comparison UI. And you can do this since the Quebec release. So if you're not on Tokyo, that's fine. You can do this on San Diego too. It's absolutely fine. You'll get exactly the same functionality. The reason it's grayed out is because it's trying to protect me from making my own mistake and overwriting it, okay? So if I was to click this padlock, and maybe I did know better, maybe I do write and read Japanese. I don't, but imagine I do for a second. I could potentially, you know, type away in here. Right? And if I wanted to publish those translations, I could hit publish up here, and that's when the record will be populated in the tables. But maybe I just want to retranslate it, just for you guys, right? So I'm going to save a quick draft. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send it to Microsoft, because I have an integration with Azure on this instance. Okay. So what's going to happen when I click Machine Translate is it's only going to send this one. It's not going to send the others, because we already have values for them. Okay. So there's no need to waste a token for that. So if I hit Machine Translate, that's going to go to Microsoft in my example, but if you've got another one, that's absolutely fine. And then we're going to get a translation come back. Now, already, the keynote amongst you, if you saw it, this shouldn't be translated. And this goes back to my comment earlier about the quality of translations. And that's because Microsoft doesn't know my business terms and phrases. It doesn't know my glossary, okay? So really, you don't want to translate a product name. You don't want to translate company names because they may not be known as that. So that goes into that glossary and style guide concept. And then obviously I can protect it if I want to. So then that won't be overwritten. Okay. So let's take this one step further. Let's say I wanted to translate this portal. So if I just do a quick refresh, I wanted to translate all of those widgets along the top. I want to translate the content um, aspects on the top, the widgets, Maybe I wanted to translate these topics. Maybe I wanted to translate all of these quick links and maybe the applications as well, right? If you've done it the old way, that could be quite an endeavor, right? Let's say we could go to the portal table. Let's say we could go to the portal record. And I have a blog post on all of this, so you're absolutely fine to use it. Now we know that we are on our portal record in question, which is on the SP portal table. Sure. With that piece of information, we can write a query it becomes our artifact. We know what all these pages are. We know we have a page root map. We know that we have um, widgets and widget instances in each of those pages. That's fine. We know we have catalogs. We know we have a taxonomy. Let's see what happens if I request translations for it. And let's say I want it in Japanese. Now this will take a moment because it's a very big query, but let's see what it does. Now I'm going to challenge chat. How many strings do you think make up the demo ESC portal? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, there was one question in the meantime about the machine translate button. Uh, mm -hmm. And Corinna asked, she was a little confused where that sends the translate. You mentioned Azure. So does Azure translate it for you? If you configure it to do that. So that's what we call a setting. And I'll show you that in a second when mm -hmm. this task is generated. That's a good question. It can be um, Azure or Google or IBM or whatever yep. service you set up that. Yep. Yep. So if I quickly load this one and if we go back to here while that's loading in the section of the localization framework, you have to define a setting. And the setting could either be one that rules them all, so it doesn't matter what artifact you're using, you tell it to go over there, that's fine, you can do that. Or you can create one per artifact, or you could even create one per artifact per language if you wanna be that kind of granular, right? So if I go to the catalog item one, which is the one we just ran, 
I've told it all these languages, I want it to go to Microsoft, or I want to allow Microsoft to be usable because that's what I've got configured on this instance. And if I go to workflow preferences, these are those different pre-canned workflows that we have. So if you want to go 100% automated and you know not worry too much about the quality, you potentially could go fully auto-translate, auto-publish. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, but if you need to be quick, it's there. That's the takeaway. So if we go to the task that we've just generated, we can see that our portal is partially translated. Put your numbers strings? in chat. We want to know what you think, how many strings yeah. need to be translated. And I'll show you the UI so you can guess. So we're gonna to have to think about all of these, all of these, all of these. And this is not including catalog items and not including knowledge articles. This is just the UI. Be brave. People are afraid to guess. <laughs> I say it's 20,000. Oh, it is a few thousand. <laughs> 3,000 comes in. Oh, it's more than three. <laughs> Six and a bit thousand. Six and a half. So if I collapse it. We're using the same process. We're using the same UI, the comparison UI. And this artifact, which is freely available, you guys can use it. It's on my blog post. I talk how you can do it and how it all works. It's broken everything up into the portal, the theme, the footers, all the different sections that you would care about. And if you want to tweak it and you want to modify it, absolutely fine. It's there for you guys. If you wanted to take and strip out one of the functions and say, I just want to do the uh, taxonomy, or I just want to do a certain page on a certain widget, you can do that if you want to. The idea was just to show the art of the possible. So if I wanted to translate all of this into Japanese and pick up those last strings, I could again send that to Microsoft Azure because that's what I've configured. And then when I go to the portal, I could change my language. Notice we also have a nice new mm -hmm. language switcher widget. I could go into Japanese. And then when the page refreshes, we will see the interface in Japanese. So you've just seen when this refreshes that you can technically translate a portal quite quickly. That is amazing. I wish I had that six years ago. <laughs> that would have been so great. <laughs> That would have made my life so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I had colleagues from Poland asking for translations and the colleagues from the Netherlands and from Sweden. I'm like, I am so sorry, people. I don't, I don't speak either of those languages. I couldn't, I couldn't guarantee for the uh, localization to be good. Um, so I only offered German and English. And there you go. If I scroll down, you can see it's all there. Yeah. That's so that's amazing. All right. Do you think we should head back to the presentation for the last two minutes to give you a chance sure. to wrap up? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Yeah. So we have a bunch of links. Um, if you go to the CSC, um, the plan your localization page is very, very helpful. We've got a workbook. So if this is a completely new and alien concept to you guys of how would you stand up a team? How do you get into the idea of the development practices and whatnot? check out the workbook. It will get you really helpful on that in terms of if you're doing a project, where do you begin? If you're trying to maintain an instance that is going to add a language that you haven't done in the past, you can do that. We have training, the localization expert series and now learning with loads of different modules. The first one goes through that localization framework and the principles of how it works. Then it gets into more about how to do a deep dive on the project and a plan it out, scoping and all those different things. What a process owner needs to know, what a platform owner needs to know. And then it goes into some of the more advanced considerations. Um, we've got internationalization guidelines on the developer site, which talks about, like I said, the word ratios of Italian being longer than maybe South Korean, for example. And obviously we've got documentation as well. But on the plan your localization page, you should also see a tile that takes you directly to our forum on uh, community as well. And we've got some very deep dive topics on there, especially that portal artifact and a configurable workspace artifact as well. We, um, I will uh, share those resources and the links on the community post uh, that you follow to to get here. Um, I will uh, quickly call out the last question. So the last question is about um, very manual efforts in f getting translations into every field. 
it's very tedious, would you recommend we connect with something like Azure? Uh, would it do this automatically and not require the manual work? Um, I would definitely suggest looking at the localization framework. Um, whether you use Azure or not doesn't really matter. It would simplify the act, but you may still need to review the translations. But if you want to go through in more detail, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and uh, we can do demos, we can go through solutioning. That's absolutely fine. My team itself is actually customer facing as well. So if you need any further deep dives, that's absolutely fine. Awesome. All right, my last couple of slides, as I said, I would love for some feedback. So please uh, take two minutes to answer these questions. You'll get another email from our marketing team um, after this session that asks for your feedback uh, specifically. Um, and then um, the uh, other platform academies that I was talking about, we have academies about analytics, mobile, virtual agent, AI, and Next experience. Please check those out. My colleagues are doing amazing jobs uh, in their academies, have incredible topics as well. And that is all that we have for today. I thank you so, so much, Alex. This was so enlightening. This was an amazing um, session. I thank learned a lot preparing this session and, and doing this session. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And I hope to see you all again in two weeks. Our next uh, session will go through some different integration options and which uh, kinds of integrations you can use to connect your ServiceNow instance to other systems. Uh, have a wonderful day or a wonderful rest of your night. Um, if you're in Europe, a wonderful morning in APJ and see you next time. Goodbye.